and local data. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we see happening in Rhode Island and what we project to happen in Rhode Island. So this map, um, this is data from Climate Central, which is a great resource if anyone is looking for local data. Um, but basically what this map shows is if we don't change the way we are acting right now, the way that we use fossil fuels, by the end of the century, Rhode Island is going to be like Deerfield Beach, Florida. And that is not a good thing. <laughs> and we're not talking about just in January when we're all normally freezing and hoping that we could go to Florida. We're talking about, you know, high 90s into the hundreds every single day of the summer. You know, it's not where we want to be. Not only is that going to be very unpleasant for us as humans, but it will create an imbalance for all of our natural systems that we rely on here in Rhode Island and across the country. Um, so precipitation, I'm sure many of you are from Rhode Island or live in Rhode Island. Was anyone, who was here in 2010? So 2010, we had some disastrous floods in Rhode Island. Um, this is not just a rare event. This is an indication of somewhat, something that has been happening more and more since the 50s. So Rhode Island is actually the state that has had the highest increase in extreme precipitation events in the whole country. So since 1958, our extreme precipitation events have increased 76%. So we may be a small state, but this has major implications for us as res residents, citizens, in terms of our infrastructure, our local businesses. Um, the photo on the bottom left is the Warwick Sewer Treatment Authority underwater in the 2010 floods. <coughs> These are the types of impacts we're seeing happening already, and this is because of climate change. Um, this summer and fall, we have had some of the worst drought we've seen in a very long time. And there are people, we have champions in our community speaking up. So Chief Lloyd, the fire chief in Tiverton, has been ringing bells, <laughs> trying to get people's attention because the emergency water source that the fire department relies on to put fires out got too low for them to be able to access. And there are m many reasons why this is happening, but climate change is one of them, because we are not getting enough rain. So we get extremes, like I talked about here, but then there are months and months where we have no rain that we rely on both for our agriculture, for our emergency systems, for our drinking water. Does anyone here have a private well? Anyone? Rel Oh my gosh, that's a lot more than I expected. So we turn on our tap and expect water to just come out, but that is not, that's not necessarily the new normal for everybody. So I don't know if anyone here who's well, if you're having issues with your wells, but it's not just a West Coast issue. You know, I think New Englanders, we hear about drought in other parts of the country and we think, oh, well, we're water rich, but we are not water rich anymore. And it's something that we need to be much more aware of. Um, Another threat we face is hurricane intensity. So the last real, we haven't had a hurricane in a while, actually. We had Superstorm Sandy come through, obviously. But we might not actually see more hurricanes with climate change. What climate science shows us is that when we do see hurricanes, they are li likely to be more extreme and intense. We might not have more, which is a good thing, but they're going to be more powerful. And that's we have to prepare for that and really think about how to make our communities more resilient to these types of storms. Um, so sea level is rising. Um, the Newport tide gauge is, is one of the places where we measure sea level rise in the state. Um, we've already seen eight inches since 1880, but the increase in sea level rise is it's going up quite dramatically now compared to that time. So NOAA has projections based, so this is to the end of the century. This is completely dependent on the action we all take. So if we can take action today, our communities and states taking action locally, we can make a difference here. But if we don't take action, what NOAA is projecting is that we'll see upwards of seven feet of sea level rise in, in Rhode Island. That means that a lot of our 22 coastal communities, a large portion of their community will be underwater. And this is, this, is, this is very real. And I know this is scary, so I really appreciate you all coming here because this is not the most uplifting topic for 10 a.m. in the morning.
but it is also a great opportunity, and we all need to come together to address it. So um, there's a great tool that we have in our state called Storm Tools. We're some of the leaders in the country, actually, with these kind of tools. So you can all access it. It's actually quite easy. It's, it's not too hard to use. It's a mapping tool that helps to show sea level rise and storm surge uh, based on these projections. So if you, want, if you live in a community and you want to see what's the potential, if one foot of sea level rise occurs, well, how is that going to impact your community? This tool will help you sh see that. So what I'm, sh I'm showing a, a pretty work, not the worst, but a worst case scenario here. So here we are at the convention center. Uh, I think that's about 12 feet of water. Um, so this map shows seven feet of sea level rise. So worst case scenario, we get seven feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. And we have a 1% annual storm. So it's a, a bad storm. Um, this has major implications, as I'm sure you all can imagine, in many, many ways. But one of the things I want to point out, since we're here to talk also about health, is that our major trauma center for the state is here, the only trauma center is at Rhode Island Hospital, which is in fairly a fairly vulnerable area because the major ways to get to Rhode Island Hospital are along our coast. Um, which are vulnerable both to sea level rise and storm surge. And so there's lots of planning and preparation we need to have in thinking about our public health systems and how they are also vulnerable to the changes that we see in cl for climate. From a public health standpoint, there's ecological changes that also occur with climate change. So who has allergies in this room? Okay, so. Unfortunately, with climate change, we have seen not only a, a dramatic increase of adults throughout this country and children who are starting to have seasonal allergies who've never had them before, but we're seeing an increase in both pollen production, so higher levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere actually create, cause plants to produce more pollen, which is just a really unfortunate thing for us with bad seasonal allergies. But our seasons are extending. The warm seasons are extending. Our winters are getting shorter and shorter on both ends. So if you have allergies either in the spring or the fall, you're going to have up, we're already seeing in the northern latitude up to 20, we already have 20 more days of pollen exposure. And our projections towards the end of the century show that we could have another 30 added on to that. So there are not only health implications for this, but there are economic implications. I have very bad allergies and take a lot of meds to deal with it and it makes me feel better, but that means not only am I having to take more pharmaceuticals, but there are days where I'm probably not as productive as I could be. So there are, there are economic implications for us as well to think about. Um, and, it, and there's education. So when I go and talk to allergists, I, I ask them if they are aware of the seasons extending, and, and they are, and they say that their patients know, but there's sort of an outreach piece to this as well. Um, our mos mosquito season is lengthening, so this, you know, it just means more exposure, potential exposure to disease. It's also just a nuisance. Um, we also, you know, with new diseases like Zika coming up, there's, there's a lot of um, other research and understanding we need to have as communities about how we can prepare for mosquito-borne diseases. I think in many ways mosquitoes are mostly seen as just a nuisance, but with new diseases, coming up into the United States, we need to think about how are we prepared to deal with, you know, getting rid of mosquitoes. And there are things we can do at the local level to control mosquito populations without using pesticides. Um, our tick population has also really expanded throughout the state. So this map shows over the past 20 years, which it's still, mosquito. our ticks are really still a South County, most at risk if you're in South County, you're most at risk if you're in South County, but there are ticks all over the state, and so there's a real education piece to make sure people are aware of how to protect themselves, because we want people to enjoy the outdoors. We want people outside exercising, and we need to think about, as our winters get warmer and ticks can survive, how do we make sure people know how to protect themselves? Um, and I'm gonna talk about some of our programs that we have to address some of these issues. Uh, this is a graphic that was developed by the CDC just to show all of the environmental changes related to climate change and how they then relate to health impacts. Um, so as you can see, the things that I've talked about today, I've touched on a lot of these, but not all. Um, I haven't really talked about water quality changes. There's, there's too much to, 
to talk about that we can fill into this time, but this gives you a nice overview of the many, many different considerations that we have to take into account when thinking about climate change and public health. <laughs>